Is this a crap? To my death by this moment. Uh, I think it's ready. In the basement, uh, cutting out and uh, picked up. I don't know how much it is. Also, there is another handout. Mary uh, Mer uh, Mer is Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Two things. So, uh, probably we can begin with Mary uh, Shelley's uh, book. Uh, the book has uh, three, three chapters, three books. Without the novel, the, the three books. So it's a medium length story. Short story, kind of short story, but uh, full of. Uh, all of you uh, must have seen the book of Frankenstein, did you? Yes. Which one? Yes. I did. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I'll, I'll be, it'll be interesting to me. And uh, today, uh, finally, uh, uh, we're going to have a look at the uh, Daniel Albright's biography, a very, very short one, and uh, uh, also introduction to the BB80 uh, biography on Wikipedia. You know, uh, Wikipedia is a big history and uh, we hardly go there, right? So, we'll go to the uh, biography on four people, four people, four people. And uh, today we'll probably we'll go to the uh, point by Gage Lawrence uh, for the last time because uh, uh, a few of you, a couple of you, uh, Talks about uh, uh, Swan and uh, uh, and some of the points have a discussion. So we're going to read the point and then uh, we're going to read the commentary made by the student. And uh, in here, uh, 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 for group discussion, you are going to read a very strange point. Uh, this point is the conclusion to the whole book called A Vision. A Vision. This book is the strangest book. Right? So, uh, it, it's interesting to see uh, uh, if you look at uh, this point as a good to the uh, uh, very strange book. And as you know, the book has uh, stories written over a long period of time throughout his life. And uh, the point is to conclude. Okay. And, uh, so it's kind of interesting. And I'd like to uh, uh, see how you react to this one, each of the groups. And last time, uh, group two had okay. I still feel that. And so, <coughs> also, uh, you did the introductions, uh, summary of the introduction twice, and uh, this time you made it shorter. Still, it's very strange. Louis did a very, very good job. The short one is also interesting, and uh, uh, he he wrote it about the point, and the uh, uh, expectation is long, or quite long, and he did a lot of research, so he deserves. Okay, right, I'm going to read it to you. And, uh, uh, I'm happy uh, to see many of you have the uh, occasion okay. uh, But still, um, you do not follow the rules. Right? Uh, writing is a lot of uh, It's a kind of rule you have to follow. Right? Uh, in a sentence, uh, the first word uh, of the first, you know, first, first, uh, uh, the first word, right? the first word, the first letter should be just nice. <coughs> But you forget it. <coughs> also, uh, a point should be set up with uh, quotation marks. Those are quotation marks, and I think with quotation marks. Uh, some of you, you can decide the wrong. Of course, uh, in a printed book, some points are printed uh, in italics. But uh, in your writing, we have to follow a certain rule, so, uh, a certain rule, and uh, that's the MLA uh, in English, in the MLA. By the language association, read a book and call MLA Stein. So you have to follow it. But it's a promise, right? So, uh, still, uh, uh, 
version student does not know consist is a transitive noun. The intransitive noun. We use it in transitive only. So you can say it is consist of, it is composed of. I don't make mistake. We don't know why, but we have to follow it. So think like that. I'll uh, okay. I'll go to the. Uh, the first one, right? Uh, page two, six, 267, uh, the poem calls Lida, actually Lida and the Swan, Lida and Swan. The first one was by, it is taken from Yeish's book, A Vision, Lida. Did you find it? Okay, the first poem, Lida by H. A, a sudden blow, colon, right? The great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs are crushed by the dark webs. Her nape caught in his bill, he holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified vague fingers push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs? And how can body laid in the rush but feeling strange? Feel, feel the strange heart beating where it lies. A shudder in the loins engenders there, the broken wall, the burning roof, and the tower and Agamemnon dead, being so caught up, so messed by the brute bloody of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak could let it drop? One of students did a very interesting essay about this. Right? Okay, we're going to read it uh, later. And let's go to... Lawrence's Swan, page uh, 435, 435, Swan. Far off, at the core of space, at the quick of time, beats and goes, still, the great swan upon the waters of all endings. The swan within vast chaos, within the electron, electron, For us, no longer he swims calmly, nor clucks across the forces following his great gay trail of happy energy, nor is he nesting passive upon the atoms, no flying north, desolative icewards to the slip of ice, no feeding, feeding in the marsh marshes, nor nor honking home-like into the twilight. But he stooped now in the dark upon us. He's treading our women, and we men are put out as the vast white bird follows our featherless women with unknown shocks and stamps his black marsh feet on the white and marshy flesh. I think uh, D. H. Lawrence must have known this I, I don't know, okay, and Lida. Come not with kisses, not with grasses of hands and lips and murmurings. Come with the hiss of wings and see touch tip of beak and treading of wet web, waving working feet into the marsh of belly. And uh, none did uh, talk, talk about Give us cars. There are people. A few people talked about this poem. There are people. When people are dead and peaceless, they hate life. They only like carrion. Dead bodies, carrion. When people are dead and peaceless, they hate happiness in others with thin, screaming hatred. As the vulture that screams, high up, almost inaudible, hovering to pack out the eyes of the still living creature. And a couple of you did uh, cerebral, maybe four, four people, students, cerebral emotions. I'm sick of people's cerebral emotions that are born in their minds and forced down by the will onto their poor deranged bodies. 
people feeling things they in, intend to feel, they mean to feel, they will feel just because they don't feel them. For of course, if you really feel something, you don't have to assert that you feel it. Uh, at least uh, a co one, one, one student did a very good essay about this. And one student did uh, this poem, Wealth and Futures. When men are made in bottles and emerge as squeaky gullibles with no bodies to speak of, and therefore nothing to have feelings with, they will still squeak intensely about the feelings. Be prepared to kill you if you say you've got none. And uh, strange, uh, several, several did uh, this poem, the next poem, to women, as far as I'm concerned. The feelings I don't have, I don't have. The feelings I don't have, I won't say I have. The feelings you say you have, you don't have. The feelings you would like us both to have, we neither of us have. The feelings you ought to have, they never have. If they say they've got feelings, you may be pretty sure they haven't got them. So if you want either of us to feel anything at all, you'd better abandon all idea of feelings together. Blank, none did it, and that's it. And uh, let's look at the reaction to the poem. Uh, it's interesting to see the length of the lines of this poem are, is consistent, inconsistent. Also, unlike the other two poems about the mythology of Leland's one, there is another person that narrates the situation. The narrator is an ordinary man and observes what happens. In the first stanza, the word go still, great swan, seem to be deliberately chosen as they start with the same letters, which gives an effect to, to the listener. Many of the lines start with the preposition or a conjunction, which is also interesting. Until the third stanza, the readers don't know what is happening in it. Everything happens at the third stanza, in the third, third stanza. Not everything, but <laughs> yeah, I know the emphasis. Park Jin? Park Jinhee? Park Jinhee, okay. Uh, it's Lawrence's uh, poem, Celebrate Emotions. The poem pres presumes that there are two different kinds of feeling. People's cerebral emotions are differ differentiated from the real feelings, and they are forced down by the will because people do not feel the real things. Cerebral emotions are described as something unnatural, unreal, even pretentious. Cerebral emotions are described as something. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, the real feelings are portrayed in the poem as the natural flow of oneself because you don't have to assert that you feel it. The contrast between the two types of feelings take the readers aback and make them think about such questions as what is different between the two, whether or not uh, they themselves are pretending to feel or able to feel the real things and what exactly we, we are feeling. Uh, ex uh, also, the critical tonal point, which is especially evident from the expression I, I'm sick of, alarms the readers to the extent that they raise suspicion of what they know, or believe to know of emotions. Lee so Dead Dead people. Dead people. In the first danger of the poem is this. When people are dead and peaceless, they hate life. They don't like carrion. I find this short, this short one sentence stanza very strong because this sentence basically is talking about contemporary people who are having busy and worldly routine. The word carrion uh, sounds to me like money or food, uh, which is destined to be corrupt. The second stanza starts with the same phrase with the first stanza, when people are dead and priceless, which gives rhythm and coherence to emphasize the state of dead people. The next phrase is 
uh, they hate happiness in others, with thin, screaming hatred, as the vul uh, vulture that climbs hi high up, almost inaudible, audible, hovering to peck out the, the eyes of living, still living creature. This also com conveys a strong message to people nowadays don't have space in their mind to appreciate others' happiness, and even jealous of the happiness. These unhappy people are likened to vultures to convey a message that modern people hate others' happiness and even want others to suffer because they also suffer in their routine to make a living. And sick, uh, Louis, where did you read this? Sick? Sick. Oh, yeah, sick. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a kind of long essay. Long essay, long. <laughs> Dish Lawrence grew up in a rough mining town with two blue color parents. So he begins with a biography. Growing up in a strenuous environment, it is alarming to read this poetry and to agree with these critics, with these critics who accuse him of being against democracy and in favor of a dictatorship and against society, being <clears throat> individuals. Terry Eagleton situates Lawrence on the radical right wing of politics as hostile to democracy, liberalism, socialism, egalitarianism. Unfortunately, while reading this poetry, his poetry, it is clear to see he does not favor society nor individuality, specifically the emotions individuals are inclined to express. For example, in sick, Lawrence juxtaposes society and this despair. He writes, quote, they came so cultured, even bringing little gifts, so they packed a sh shred of life and flew off with a crock of sneaking exultance. Uh, <clears throat> close, closing quotation. The diction used by Lawrence is what marvels me. He's crit criticizing society for being cultured and bringing little gifts which are usually traits we, we would call it admirable and noteworthy. Yet, Lawrence accuses these people of making him sick. However, the individuals in the poem are worshiping him. But he decides to describe their adoration with the word crock, bringing annoying frogs and other strange animals to mind. Then he calls them the dad later in the poem. Having lived in poverty for most of his life, dealing with illnesses such as tuberculosis, malaria, dying at, at the young age of 44. It's strange that Lawrence would accuse society of making him sick. Maybe he does not really mean ill, but annoyed. We all use sick in this sense when we describe something or someone who is getting bothersome, for example. Oh, he's really making me sick because of his uh, all these stupid jokes. Even accusing society of annoying him is rather unfair, especially to the point to refer them as bad people. With this young upbringing in mind, it's hard for me to understand, uh, comprehend how he could be so harsh to his fans of adoration. I would think someone in poverty would appreciate being admired. So, with my stubborn bias, I studied the poem in search of another reason for his condemnation. I think the phrase, sneaking so exaltation is the key to this poem's secret. Maybe this implies his dictators are the ones ripping him apart, flying away, but still exalting him secretly. Now, <clears throat> here is a portion of letter which I think will help prove that Lawrence would punish his critics so harshly. It is a 1908 letter from Lawrence to Blanche Jennings. If I had my way, I would build a lethal chamber as big as the Crystal Palace with a military band playing softly and the cinematograph working brightly, then I'd go, go out in the back, back streets and main streets and bring them in, all the sick, the halt, the maimed. I'd lead them gently and they would smile me, a willy thanks, and the band would softly bubble out the hallelujah chorus. After reading this letter, I'm convinced he softly accused the critics and detractors of making him sick. He then kills them with the conclusion of his poem and possibly imagines doing so with a lethal gas chamber when he says, I'm trying now to learn never to give up my life to the death, never, not the tiniest shred. So it, it's interesting, right? <laughs> he takes a very interesting 
uh, information. Okay. Yum Dongyo? Yum Dongyo? Oh. Uh, about uh, two women, as far as I'm concerned. This poem by D.H. Lawrence is quite aggressive and direct as well as thought insightful. He seems to be talking to women in general, but could be talking to a woman, a woman in particular. The refusal to admit to having feelings and are not persistent, uh, present within, denying that others are also incapable of having feelings seems extreme. He even outright says that People, people are lying if they say not, they do have feelings and that one should abandon all idea of feelings in order to feel anything at all. We should note that, that we are not to give up feelings, but the idea of feelings, which are different. Uh, Kim Dogyeong? Kim Dogyeong, okay. Leader. Uh, you mean uh, Yeats or D.H. Lawrence's? Yeats, okay. At the first glance, the poem Lida is violent sexual, depicting the rape of Lida by a Jews, transformed as most one. The Miss of Lida is the story of rape and the birth of Helen, the most beautiful woman in Greek mythology and the case of the Trojan War. Behind the sexual scene, we see that the, po the poem goes beyond its initial obscenity and the race about uh, civilization, about war, and the process of civilization that comes after the period of violence. The swan after the rape will bring the feathered glory to Lida, whose helpless body feels terrified yet with a strange sensation of pleasure. Will the rape, which symbolizes war, bring knowledge and glory after broken worlds, and burnt roofs, and towers? The question seems to be answered in the final lines, where the swan drops Lida with a different beak. After reading Yeats's commentary and the whole myth of Lida and Lida and, and a swan, it is possible to conclude that such Godly conquest won't result in peace or improvement, but rather in different destruction. A very proper conclusion, right? Uh, considering the what is happening in the world now, right? Uh, summary, 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 summary. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Now let's go, go to the summary of the uh, introduction to Albright's book, Quantum Poetics. Uh, you did two summaries, right? And these are the shorter summary of the, and uh, Kim Isu? Okay, summary. This book provides, provides us with three propositions regarding the English movement. Uh, modernist poets, uh, their effort to link between text and free verbal origins, seeking for the elementary particles and the isolation of poeming, the waves, and so on. Okay, good. Uh, Brown? Sarah? Uh, this summary is quite good. Poems like anything else are made up of particles and waves, although refers to these poetic uh, particles as poemims. Pseudo pseudomorphism is also a concept discussed, uh, which claims that uh, the fact that something is, written, uh, is not written in the proper theory principles does not always mean, it, mean it's bad. It's also important to understand literature as a series of experiences, not just as a standalone text for each era of writer. <coughs> The elements of experience are different, but overall, authors like Yeats, Pound, and Elliot utilize this. Uh, utilize this uh, to expand on the idea they present their text. Different poets uh, use different literary elements to create new literary compounds, if you will. With each of these new compound results, there is a different post-text post post experience left behind. Each of different experiences becomes uh, the defining materials that build on the next style of poetic writing, influencing writers and scientists alike to continue to challenge the previous principles laid before them. Chad? 
Okay. Daniel Albright's introduction to quantum poetics attempts to explain to the reader what the book is about. He explains that it's a book with three large propositions. First, being that the English modern poets endeavored to take down barriers that divide the text from its messy, pre-verbal origins and from its, from its digestion in the mind of the reader. In the second proposition, where it starts to get confusing and esoteric, he says that physicists aided in inspiring poets to seek out the elementary particles of which poems were constructed, poemims, one might call them. He explains that these two, these, these first two propositions are associated because the search for the poemim necessitates research into the central operations of the imagination. His third proposition says that the more closely the modernists attempt to define the poemim, the more it, it, it becomes, uh, the more difficult it becomes to catch. He tells of a particle model developing itself for uh, uh, analyzation of the behavior of poems while simultaneously the wave model develop. He then makes a wild pro proclamation that if a poem is made, not of little bits of poem stuff arranged by the poet, but of out of beams or, or radio waves or x-rays, it'll have quite differently. It'll, it'll, it'll behave quite differently. He says that this different behavior of poem will empower new and occasionally disconcerting affinities between the poet and the audience. Louise? The author claims early 20th century writers wanted to change poetry from being seen as the conception of poem separately from the understanding of the poem. And physicists help inspire poets create a pseudoscience. The pre-creation of a poem was elusive then. The author introduces and elaborates on the idea of pretext, which is about the possibilities of a poem before it's published. Or the past lives, a published text has already lived. So, the poet is a medium that captures a piece of art reincarnating through eternity and places. It, it, uh, it uh, places, places it uh, down on, pa on, a pa on paper. Then the writer gives examples of poets who had strived to make poetry extremely scientific and uh, create terms and equations. He mentions Einstein and the controversy this physics created with cha chaotic and random universe. Then the butterfly effect is mentioned when describing division among poets who wanted the wave model to be correct as opposed to the particle model. Then uh, Fresnel is mentioned and his findings of light waves. The poets saw this as a Fresnel creating a science of nothing, so they planned to apply this to poetry. Then Plato and Lawrence described writing as plucking signals from, from the divine. Uh, interesting. You, you, you are very good at making things interesting, right? <laughs> okay. You say, Kamsamnida? Good, good. Okay, uh, why don't we finish the introduction, the third part, and then we'll go to the uh, group discussion uh, point. Okay. <coughs> Okay, uh, part three, Poem Waves, page 15. Uh, physicists are easily embarrassed by metaphors. Since homely analogies they can't easily account for the behavior of the very small and very large things. And yet physicists can hope to explain their discoveries only by means of metaphors. Poets are easily embarrassed by facts. Think of Matthew Arnold laboriously revising his published work because of his errors 
concerning the operation of a spinning wheel or the his ignorance of accent of the word tintagel, but are perfectly at home in the kingdom of metaphor. Because their skills are complementary, physics and poets have sometimes felt a certain desire to cooperate. <clears throat> Two of the controlling explanatory metaphors physics are, of course, particles and wave. And over the centuries, the physicists have worked hard to avoid being meshed by either of these two competing systems of thought. Does light consist of particles or wave? Newton was perfectly aware that certain aspects of behavior of light tend to support the wave model. But most of his writings tend to assert that light is an aggregate of substantial particles. The least light or part of light which may stop alone without the rest of light or uh, propagate alone or do or suffer any, anything alone which the rest of light uh, does not or suffer not, suffers not, I call a ray of light. As Buchwald notes, this amounts to defining a ray as a natural of light, but Newton was extremely cherry about metaphors, especially when he could find some way to avoid them. I put this known fingo. Newton grandly announced and is coronally follows easily, I do not feign metaphors. Whatever light be, I suppose, it consists of rays differing from one another in contingent circumstances as a bigness, form, or vigor, like as 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 the stands on the shore, the waves of the sea, the face of man, all other natural things of the same kind differ. Newton claimed to be indifferent to the troll. Call, call, raise, ra call, raise the grain, gra grains of sand, or call them waves as you please. But many lay readers have found that the explanatory metaphor science, however tentatively or godly presented, have important consequences in orienting the human race toward reality. Voltaire, uh, in his uh, uh, Anglais, uh, Calico is the Vertigo, involved in crossing the English Channel and thereby traveling from uh, one map of the cosmos to his complete opposite. Uh, I skip the quote. We'd like to know whether our lives are fruitfully and fully tossed about in the eddings of whirlpools or merely the faint modulation of a vacuum. The opposition between the particle model and the wave model also has certain consequences in our feeling toward our world. The particle model tends to promote the scientific view in which isolated huddled bits are more important, more real than the relations and interrelations among them, in which the spectator is, despite Heisenberg, well insulated from the object of study. We will see, however, in chapter two of this study, just how exciting the particle model can become to poets of a certain temperament. But for many poets, the particle model is simply the Antichrist, as Blake wrote. The atoms of uh, Democritus and Newton, Newton's uh, particles of light or sands upon the Red Sea shore, where Israel's tents do shine so bright. The wave model, by contrast, tends to promote a poetic view in which the cosmos is a plenum, twanging web. Every event modifies the indefinitely elastic hole. The flapping of a butterfly in China causes hurricanes in the Atlantic. And every object is merely a thickening of the general vibrancy the relation is more real than the entities that are related. In the early 19th century, when science, for the most part, categorically uh, asserted that the light was made of atoms, Gaussian uh, Fresnel devised the equation that explained interference uh, phenomena as the intersection of competing waves, and the upheaval of the particle model was quick and thorough. The wave model of light is so conducive to uh, rapture that it is difficult for even the uh, uh, summary scientist not to sound political when describing it. Here is the Fresnel in 1814. I tell you, I'm strongly tempted to believe in the vibrations of a particular fluid for the transmission of light and heat. One would easily con conceive why a body loses so much heat without losing weight. 
why the sun has for so long shined upon us without diminishing its volume, etc. By rendering light unphysical, inertialess, personal, <coughs> has made the sun eternal. The majesty of light is no longer compromised by the coarseness or bitterness. Just as a scientist like Fresno may feel that the nature of light is uh, falsified by any model that seeks to reduce the beam to isolated rays, each perhaps with his own little mat. So a poet may feel the nature of poetry is falsified by any model that seeks to reduce the poem to heaps of tropes or images. Again, the modern sage, always attracted to poetic extremes, led to some remarkably violent rejections of particular models of poetry. For such poets, the elementary units of modernist poetics were vexations in that they often refused to dis disengage themselves cleanly from the surrounding tissue of words as hard, palpable bowls of meaning. They seemed to exist only when in emotion, as if their rest uh, uh, their, their rest mass were zero. And so, the modest poets experiment with these uh, imp, imp, uh, implications of a poetics in which there existed at the core point precisely nothing except the beat of wavering, and sinuosity, propagation of force. The aesthetics of way turned out to be different from the aesthetics of the particle. The investigation of physics into the nature of elementary particle gave strength to a one class poet. The poet researcher, the poet engineer, carefree and consciously following the inward path into the ultimate sources of artistic power. The investigation of physics into the phenomena of radiation gave strength to another class of poet. The poet rhapsode, compulsive, and, uh, convulsive, uttering irresistible words in a trance of inspiration. Since the day of Plato, the rap, uh, left sword has always been described by by means of metaphors from science. I'll skip. Lawrence, one of the purest members of the School of the Wave, described the artist almost identically, but using sophisticated metaphors provided by uh, Macroni. I'll skip. I'd like to think that both Plato and Lawrence used such metaphors with a certain amu amused irony, but the, f the evidence is far from con conclusive. According to particle aesthetics, the stress of attention falls on the text or on some hypotext beneath it. The words themselves convey the poem meme across the gap beneath writer and reader. Chemist describing reactions, distinction between electron donors and the electron acceptors. And the reaction of writer and reader can be described similarly as a collusion in which the writer donates a particle and the reader accepts it. The more closely the reader can attend to the details of syntax, alliteration, World, world sequence, act, actus, and other minor textual gestures, the more likely the donation is, occur, is to occur. But according to the wave aesthetics, the word per se are of uh, little account. What matters is the telepathic stream uniting writer and reader in a state of electrical immediacy. The words are only the ether through which the wave of feeling passes urgently and spontaneously. Uh, I'll skip to Okay, B, uh, on page uh, 20, second paragraph, loss of substantiality. If a poem is built around a fundamental particle, it is possible for the critic to skewer the particle and declare this is what the poem is about. But in the poetry of the way, all words, all the words have lawfully equal density and value, and the poem resists any attempt to abstract a single control element. One of the central manifestations of wave poetics exist, therefore, the loss of prestige of the noun, the desired motility, thinness of texture is best promoted by other parts of speech. Uh, the, the sheer heft of noun, the density of the gravitational field, makes it attractive to particle 
athletics, but wave athletics prefers the ver verb. Pound was much impressed by Fernasola's demonstration that a Chinese ideogram could be interchangeably a verb. Uh, for example, uh, a, a verb, for example, uh, to shine, a noun, sun, an adjective, not bright. For Fernalosa, this indifference of the Chinese language with respect, with respect to parts of speech mirror the condition of nature itself, since nature has no parts of speech, and, and in nature, all truth is the transference of force. A farmer and his wives are simply the termini of the act of pounding. Pound became so caught up in the prestigious verb that he once declared that the beginning of the Gospel of John, verbum caro factum, should be translated, the verb was made fresh. Often in the cantors we find verbs that have been made flesh, verbs that keep reverberating in the absence of a fixed subject. The verb first line of the poem is a close with a missing subject as if action utterly supersedes the actors. This line is a translation of a translation from Homer, but the name, Odysseus, does not appear to stimulate the uh, discourse. The subject hovers unbroken above the flurry of movement, and all through the cantus pound like to begin, ver uh, begin verse paragraphs with inversions of verb and noun, like this, comes, comes, comes. Okay. The sudden uh, upthrust of the verb increased the sense that the act of coming matters more than the thing that comes. Okay. Explain well. The cultivation of verbs, however, is not strictly necessary. A determined poet can pronounce a vagrant arithmetic texture by use of non noun sequence. Uh, for example, I was so weary of the world, I was so, so sick of it, everything was changed with myself. Skies, trees, flowers, birds, water, people, houses, streets, vehicles, machines, nations, armies, war, peace talking. Makes sense, right? Moreover, the poet's ego becomes a tsunami, a sea quake lifting the whole south of Europe as if the whole great world were simply an enlarged modality of its uh, self disgust. Okay, let's go to sea. Loss of subject, subject, object, and intersubject boundary. In the poetry of the wave, the whole universe discourse becomes fluid. In New Heaven and Earth, Lawrence has, to his discomfort, uh, lost the, uh, any sense of skin. The poet also no longer knows where he, where he stops. The rest of the world begins. The flatness of the poet, the naked expressive urgency, often adds certain friction to the poetry of the wave. Though literature of this sort is usually subjective, its subjectivity is often indistinct. As this amplitude and the frequency increase, the poem wave loses any sense of final subject in a particular historical situation. When expressivity is schooled up to a high pitch, when the verbal flow becomes intense and extravagant, then it becomes hard to envisualize this course. One scream is very much like another. Okay. Okay, let's go, go to the conclusive part, page uh, twenty six. Uh, the bottom paragraph. Uh, we see then that the point of the waves needs to climb onto something dry. Similarly, the point of particles needs to dive into the water. Pound, for all his zeal to isolate the basic units of his art, discover that his aesthetic sub electrons were tentative, uh, fragile intellectual constructs. Chapter two of this book is a detailed investigation into the world of particle particles with particular emphasis on pounds, and we, we will see the very source of agitated media or vector <coughs> that appear at the end of pounds searchings for poems. From Hugh 
Selwyn, Mobilese, uh, Minuan undulations to waves taking form like glass seen underwater in chapter 25 to the wave carvings at XDUL in chapter 29 to Marconi's radio waves on chapter 38 to the crystal waves like Jean in cut glass in chapter 91. By 1920, Pound had reached the limits of the particle model as Mowbray's medallions, tangible three-dimensional images, collapse into the uninfluxed brainwaves of schizophrenic withdrawal from reality. And Pound increasingly turned in the canto to a poetics in which movement is contemplated in the absence of any particular uh, uh, particular uh, move thing, a poetics in which movement is radically simplified to uh, some light, glistening, and nearly invisible undulance, a minimum unit of grace, a particular wave, so to speak. For a full account of Pound's scientific learning and of the relation of science to the lar larger structure of Pound's thinking, the reader should turn to the excellent recent scholarship of Ian Bell and Martin Kamen. I hope only to show how metaphors from science inform certain crucial aspects of Pound's aesthetics. In the case of Elliot discussed in chapter three of this book, we see the opposite case, a point to reach the limits of the wave model and sought relief in particles. In the 1910s, when Pound was playing the role of uh, Democritus, Elliot was playing the role of the Thales, reducing all things uh, to uh, modalities of water, like a uh, number of fellow critics, I believe that theory of Portly that Eliot announced in his famous, uh, famous early, earlier essays, uh, stressing the poet's role as an impartial introspectator who chills and objectifies his own feelings into an artifice exactly proportionate to their intensity, who never dips his toe into the disgusting realm of the inexpressible. Lazarus ten tends to discuss the real achievements of Eliot very poorly, a portly of shudders and sick giggles, where feelings almost never express itself, express itself clearly or terminates in a distinct objective correlative. Yeats's long suppressed, uh, Eliot's long suppressed dissertation on Bradley provides a better description of the world of his very portly, a world in which the mind is pure liquid, a point of view spinning too quickly to view anything a bewildered vulnerability caught up in a vertigo of mutation. Eliot's uh, dissertation appeals to jellyfish and sea anominos for uh, imagery to describe the human mind. And I will investigate the latent undersea imagery in Eliot's published and unpublished uh, reportly, where the characters are, in effect, knots of water, jellyfish floating at random in the modernist waves. Elliot's conversion to Christianity seems to me a final attempt to stabilize the universe of discourse by appealing to particles, solid, uh, predetermined chunks of meaning, such as uh, biblical passages or common prayers or the word itself. It is hard, however, to be confident that uh, Elliot's later poetry is more secure or well defined than his earlier poetry. Amid the secular desolation of the rock or even four quartet, the Christ particles sometimes seem oddly unlead to their context, lead palace struck stuck in SP. Chapter one of this book will concern principally Yeats, at once modernist and uh, great forerunner of the modernists. It's remarkable how quickly and how intensely the whole modernist dialect of particle and waves appear in his work. At first glance, it seems that Yeats was strictly on the side of particles, specifically symbols, which strictly opposed to the waves. When young, Yeats considered the era, the sea, to represent all the drifting in indefinite bitterness of life. And when old, Yeats railed against modern writers as swimmers dissolving in the waters of materialism. Furthermore, the picture for Celtic mythology that most potently haunted Yeats's uh, imagination was that of Koholin taking his sword against the waves. Clearly, a strong case can be made that Yeats was the enemy of wave model of poetry, desolate in the licenses, confessional, uh, all out of shape from toe to top. Indeed, his whole career can be seen as an attempt to challenge and defend 
some shapely, perfect image of beauty from the sulcum, sulcum ambient ugliness. But Yeats was himself aware that the manufacture and perfection of intricate, gorgeous forms are only part of the rhythm, rhythm that govern the production of poems. Okay, the final chapter. Chapter one of this book will begin with the study of the uh, formlessness, empty backgrounds, dispersed textures, protopoetic materials, all pertinent to the aesthetics of the wave as manifest in Yeats' work. This will lead to the study of Yeats' bizarre relations to the youngest generation of writers he lived to read, poets whose work seemed to Yeats hop hopelessly incoherent, but who showed Yeats how to loosen the lineaments of his own poetry, how to swim in the modest ocean. At the end of the poetics of the wave, there is simply chaos. Yeats's imagination was, at all times, excited by chaos, whether the chaos of droids who turned themselves into ravens and whistles and chaos, chaos of Sitwell's uh, facade. But the chaos of English modern poetry <coughs> really reaches so far into imagelessness as, say, the arsenic of the Dada poet and colloquialist Kurt uh, Schubiter. English chaos is always picturesque, sometimes even uh, pastoral, easily conducive to new formalities, new bits of shape. For Yeats and Pound, Elliot, too, chaos is the mother of cosmos. Uh, uh, certainly, the introduction is very good, and, but very complex. So, uh, all of you summarized it uh, twice. Still, uh, it is very difficult to understand it uh, completely. Right? Uh, it, it contains uh, so much information, a lot of ideas. Right? Uh, okay. Now, uh, what kind of person Albright is? Let's see. Okay. Daniel Albright, right? Uh, was the uh, professor of literature at Harvard and the editor of Modernism and Music, an anthology of sources. He was born and grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and completed his undergraduate studies on a full scholarship at Rice. He received his MPH uh, uh, in uh, Master, yeah? Okay, Master in 1969 and the PhD in 1970. Both from Yale, Albright also is also the author of the book Quantum Poetics. We've gone through the introduction of this book, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 1997. He held an NEH fellowship from 1973 and 72 to uh, 1974, was a Guggenheim fellow, and more recently he was a uh, 2012 uh, Berlin Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. Uh, while he was here, uh, he wrote a poem, uh, Evasions. I translate it. Right? Albright began his undergraduate career as a mathematics major, but changed to English literature, although trained at Yale as a literary critic after the publication of his book, Representation and the Imagination, Packet Kafka, Nabokov, and Schoenberg. He was invited by the University of Rochester to come teach there as a kind of liaison between the Department of English and the Eastman School of Music. At Rochester, he studied musicology, which forever changed his career. Much of his subsequent work has been on literature and music, culminating in his recent book, Pan Athletics, which is I'm translating, uh, which addresses many arts and examines to what extent the arts are many and are one. He was hired in 2003 in the, in the Harvard Department of English, but later joined the Comparable Literature Department, soon began offering courses in the music department as well. Okay, these are the publications, right? So many books, right? Uh, okay, Evasion, okay, Panathetics, the last book. And Evasion, 
his only book of poetry, Evasions. And the Myth Against Myth, this is the, uh, his PhD dissertation. Right. And uh, when I got this book, I saw the dedication to Richard Elman, and I was proud. Uh, I said, Richard Elman is my hero. How did you de uh, dedicate this book to him? He said, he was my PhD director. <laughs> so we, we both of us have the same teacher, right? <laughs> Actually. OK, now. Uh, 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 Yeish was an Irish poet and one of the foremost figures of 20th century literature, a pillar of both uh, the Irish and British literary establishments. In his later years, he served as an Irish senator for two, two terms. Yeish was a driving force behind the Irish literary revival, along with Lady Gregory, Edward Martin, and others founded the Abbey Theatre, where he served as a chief, as chief. During the early years in 1923, he was awarded Nobel Prize in Literature as the first Irishman so honored for what the Nobel Committee described as inspired poetry, which in a highly artistic form gives expression to the spirit of a whole nation. H. is generally considered one of the few writers who completed their greatest works after being awarded the Nobel Prize. Very strange, right? Very rare case. Uh, usually, uh, a writer, after a writer received Nobel Prize, he can't create uh, better works. Very strange, but uh, uh, at the time, uh, when, he, he, when he died, uh, he published a new book of poetry called Last Poems. And uh, new kind of poetry was emerging in it. So if he had lived longer, he could have produced uh, a totally different kind of uh, poetry. So he is great. As I said, uh, there are many versions uh, in a poem. Right? Even after he published the poem, he revised again and again. Usually what happens to, to, to most people For example, you are a painter. You, you do a portrait, right? Portrait. Of it. And uh, <clears throat> you work on it uh, for many days. And then when you go, go back to it, you did it again. The portrait gets better and better, or what? Usually, it gets worse and worse and spoil it. That's the usual practice. Even uh, great painters do. Uh, so, but. Uh, most of the poems uh, in his uh, collected poems, you, you, can, you can choose any uh, poem by him. Uh, it, it's, it's almost perfect. It's a very rare case, right? So, uh, Yeats was born in Sandy Mount, Ireland, uh, near Dublin, educated there and, and uh, uh, there and in London. He spent childhood holidays in County Sligo, uh, mother's hometown. Okay. He was influenced by Spencer, Shelley, pre Raphael brother, brother, brotherhood. Maud Gawn. Who is Maud Gawn? Yes, is love. He waited uh, uh, both gone to marry him until the age of uh, 52. In his early 20s, he met, met her, and he had pro proposed to her several times, over and over again. But uh, she, 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 she had refused 
for some, I don't know why, but <laughs> uh, but uh, she said she uh, said somewhere that uh, uh, because I did not marry you, you became a great poet. Because I, I had not married you, you 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 became a great poet. I think that's right, right? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, do you think she is beautiful? Yeah, very beautiful. But uh, when uh, let's see. Uh, uh, it's very long. Uh, why don't you do a pa summary, one paragraph, right? Uh, consisting of uh, less than ten, ten sentences of uh, Yeats's uh, Yeats's biography, right? It's a very good work, right? Very long. Uh, that's it. Okay.